We're going to focus today. We talked about uh, this, John, in, in preparation and a big sort of trend that I see in the work that I do is that uh, there's a really big focus right now with full cycle sales reps. So that's account executives if you're working at a software company, but people being tasked with prospecting and selling, really making extra time to focus on doing the actual prospecting. <laughs> and I know that sounds really simple, but how do we as sales leaders like facilitate this activity and get reps to self-source pipeline? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, if you don't know who John is and who Force Management is, just a quick intro. He co-founded Force Management and more recently Ascender. And uh, John, not to not to date you, but it looks like you have like three decades of uh, sales experience, sales leadership experience. And uh, Force Management works in, with some pretty cool clients like Zendesk, Intercom, Medallia. We have a couple of mutual clients, all that kind of good stuff. But John, it's uh, great to have you on. Jason, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be on. Uh, congratulations to you and, you know, and building such a great following. And, and uh, so it's, it's really great for us to, to be on today. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited for the chat. So for everyone watching, uh, if you got a question, we would like to answer it sort of as they come up and we'll save a little bit of time at the end. There's a Q and a button at the bottom of the zoom screen. Make sure to click that, put your questions in there. And John, I think it would be good to sort of ask the audience a question real quick, just so we kind of have an idea of the audience. Uh, let us know in the chat, what's your role? Are you a sales rep or are you a sales leader? Are you something else altogether? Let, let us know in the chat and this will help us kind of customize the chat for today. Yeah. So we're sort of all over the place. This is what I, yeah, what I expected here. <laughs> Giovanni says ultra high performer. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> We got a bunch of sales leaders in. Cool. Okay. So when we when we think about this idea of you know turning ourselves into prospecting machines, one of the things that we talked about was you had a really interesting angle from setting the stage around planning, especially with 2023 coming up. And one of the things you talked about was understanding like the capacity of a seller. Do you want to talk a little bit more about how outbound and you know, self-sourcing pipeline fits into planning and how to figure out really what to expect of a seller as we're planning and budgeting and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I um, thank you for that. I uh, I think it really all goes back to, um, for those that are leaders listening to this, um, yeah, I think the most elite people on the planet right now, the most elite companies on the planet right now are really getting laser focused on how their buyer is buying. And what are any changes in how their buyer is buying? And once you do that first, then you really understand what you're asking your, your sales resources, your engagement resources to do. And so when I talk about understanding the capacity of the seller, you know, I, I like to really ask companies, um, you know, what exactly are you asking people to do? So they need to have mapped out. First, they should map out how the buyer buys. And if you think that's not changing right now, just look at the last couple of years. Your buyer has changed. Every single buyer, everybody that calls on a buyer that's on this uh, webinar today, every single one of your buyers has changed the way that they acquire goods and services, the way that they handle their own discovery, the way that they handle their own understanding of alternatives. And, you know, COVID and pandemic has, has you know, just changed the landscape on that. Not only that, but there's just, you know, more and more information out there. There's more and more ways for a buyer to get educated. <clears throat> so when you're really trying to understand the capacity of a seller, you then need to think about in each one of those stages of that buying process for a buyer, who's doing what when. So if I have an SDR, if I have a BDR, if I have an AE, if I have an account manager, if I have, um, you know, customer success, what exactly are we asking them to do? And I think companies and the men and women on this line uh, right now, you really have to be really in touch with what you're being asked to do and at what stage. So who's doing what, when, by role, by stage. And that will really help you understand the capacity 
of your selling organization. I think companies sometimes get that wrong. Like, okay, we're going to have our sales organization do this now. We're going to have BDRs do this now. And, be, and if you can't go back to what are we already asking them to do and kind of map it against that, are we going to add stuff? Are we going to take stuff away? Are we going to redistribute some of these ta- some of these tactical things that we do, some of these actionable things that we do, because that has moved in the buyer's buying cycle. Um, That's what I mean by understanding the capacity of the seller. Yeah. Oh, man, there's so much to go into. There's two things that stuck out to me. This kind of theme around aligning to the buyer's process and knowing how it's changed. What what have you seen in your work? You guys work with a ton of companies, a lot of large organizations. What, What has changed? in the last couple well, of years and, and, and trends more recently, probably in the last three to six months? Yeah, really great question. I think we all understand because, I mean, look, we're doing, a. am not in a studio with you. Um, you know, I don't know how many of these do you do a month? Did you always do them before COVID or what have you? Just the way that we interact today has completely changed. So everybody can understand that, um, that our world has changed a little bit on the, um, our world has changed a little bit on just the way that we interact with buyers. Okay, so we know that. But what else is changing? Well, I'll tell you what's changing right now underneath our very noses, underneath our very shoes right now, is that everybody's talking about these economic headwinds. You can't pick up a newspaper today. I saw on the Wall Street Journal last week that, you know, uh, the Wall Street Journal actually said that 100% not probability, but a hundred percent fact that there's going to be a recession next year. I mean, I thought that was pretty bold because nobody can kind of the way of manage the way of looking at a recession today versus the way we used to look at a recession even a few years ago. It's like it's really kind of convoluted. However, they made a bold statement that says a hundred percent positive there's going to be a recession. Okay, so the whole world is seeing that. And if you don't think that that changes the way, additional ways, Jason, that your buyer is going to buy, um, like right now, you know, you got companies that are holding on to cash. You got companies that are delaying non-essential expenditures. Uh, you have, you know, the and and, and the, the burden. So I'm older, right, Jason? I'm 59 years old, and I've seen this rodeo before. You know, I'm not saying that I, oh, I'm blowing off COVID. I've seen that before. I never saw COVID before, but I've seen some really tough stuff in, you know, 30 years of selling. And I'm going to tell you what never changes is the need for great companies and great sellers to understand that your buyer is going to change with things that are out of your control. And what that means is right now, you got to up your game. So I know what you you do such a great job. You got an outbound squad. I love the name of your I love the name of your company. I love the name of your focus. But like how you're teaching people to go outbound and how you're teaching people to get above the noise, uh, you know, is not the same way that you were doing it a year ago. It's not going to be the same way that you you were you're doing it this year, next year. And if if I could just end it on this, I told you I'm so wordy. I'm sorry about that, but. Um, If I could end my answer to you on this is, if you are not attaching to the biggest business issue facing your customers right now, I don't care where you are in the sales process or the buyer process, if you aren't focusing on attaching to the biggest business issue and making yourself critical to that customer's buying process, and you don't get above the noise, there's a lot of people talk about getting above the noise, you're going to struggle. And I, I, rather than turn that into, I don't want to make it seem like a threat or talk down to you. I want to give you spirit, everybody listening. There are things that you can do to be elite right now to make sure that you rise above the noise. It's not an option anymore. So all that pressure I talked about, all the economic headwinds, people hanging on to cash. I mean, how many people are out there listening right now? Customers are saying, yeah, we're a little bit delayed. I don't have that in my budget anymore. We had to cut people and, you know, giddy up. Like this is selling right now. This is selling. So I don't know if that answered your question, but what I'm seeing right now is just more and more emphasis of an outside in approach of making sure you're clearly understanding what your buyer is experiencing and then mapping what you do for a living to alleviate some of that pain. It's not, it's, you know, last 10 years we've, dude, we've been, uh, 
we've been kind of blessed. There's been so much cash on the sidelines. There's been so much money and software companies and valuations. And I'm not saying we were lazy. I'm not saying that at all, but we really got to step up the game now. Yeah. I, I feel like this is a great setup. I, I'd love to hear from you guys in the chat too. What are you hearing from prospects related to the economy? Are you getting budget objections? Are you getting some of the things that John had just mentioned? Let us know in the chat. What kind of objections? What are you hearing from your buyers, your prospects, your clients? Let us know in the chat. I think this is also kind of comforting, John, to see in the chat that if big. you're hearing those things, you're not alone. <laughs> no, yeah, big. And I and I want to give you some Everyone's spirit, Jason, and everybody. I'm hearing it. Everybody, I'm looking at it. Budget issues, budget issues, budget issues. Um, look, it's like if you're not hearing that, you're probably not talking this to the right buyer. You know, because exactly. nobody on their right mind is is like frivolously spending. So that's a really, yeah. really common one cost savings uh, actual um you know productivity issues for your buyer of their you know they're being asked to do less the you know layoffs and things like that in in the departments that you're calling on all these are real vendor consolidations another good one yeah yeah so i want to focus because we're about to get into this you know sort of more strategic tactical things that we can do from a prospecting lens before we do that though I think this is an exercise and something you can double down on as a sales leader or as an individual rep, if you're watching this, you said attach to bigger business issues, make yourself mission critical. I wanna double click on that because if you're reaching out and saying, uh, hey, John, our product has these features and we've helped other people with these things and you're not like taking the time to understand what that company is really working on right now, what the executives care about, I mean, this is everything from what you say in your cold call to the cold email to how you approach discovery. Can you just like backtrack a bit and talk about what do you mean by bigger business issues and like getting to like what the business really cares about from an outcome standpoint, especially executives and that sort of stuff? Because rising above the noise, I think people confuse that with, oh, I need to send LinkedIn messages now, not yeah. just phone. And I need to send email. Yeah, yeah, I need to include one. videos. That's not what you're talking about when you say rise no. above the noise. You're talking no. about like that messaging and really sticking to something that the business cares about. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So thank you for that. Thank you for that clarification. I would say that um, when I say attaching to the biggest business issue, what I mean by that is um, most of us, I think most of your followers that you explained to me, um, are, are, they sit right smack dab in the middle. And I don't care where you are in the process. Like if you're a BDR or you're an AM or you're an AE, just put that on the side for a second, just in general, where sellers of goods and services sit is right in between the technical requirements of a product and the business outcomes that they can impact. And right now, I want you to just take your seat at the table. If you're watching Game of Thrones or Game of Dragons or whatever it is, they got that big table. And, and like right now, I want you to just visualize taking your seat at the table. And I don't think enough people do that in business. And you, if you don't believe that you should be there, why should anybody be else? Why should anybody else believe you should be there? And the way that you take your seat at the table is that you make yourself very relevant. And what I mean by the biggest business issues facing the company, your product and services solve technical issues and fulfill requirements for companies. That's table stakes. You got to be really good at that. And Jason, what you have to be really good at is you have to, I call that decision criteria, technical decision criteria. And the most elite sellers on the planet, we can come back and talk about this one in a second. They have to influence that technical decision criteria with their differentiation. Okay, that's table stakes. Let me just hold that for a second. But that's not enough. Funding issues. It's got to go to my boss's boss. I'm just looking in the chat here. I'm I'm looking, it's got to go to the CFO. It's got to have more eyes on it and ears on it and that type of stuff. So you, you are automatically, if you do nothing different than you're doing now, you're going to get stalled. Things are going to stall. And so when I say rise above the noise, the number one thing that you can do is you can attach yourself to the biggest business issue facing the customer. 
And now you're starting to talk about business outcomes. Let me just give you a quick example. I work with a company, you know, in the past, and they tell me that they're, you know, in the banking industry, they're in fintech or whatever, and they're, I'm working with this company that's, they're in charge of the customer portal. So their technology impacts the customer portal, the way that customers interact with the banks and blah, blah, blah. And their technical differentiation that's critical, like latency and security, and all of these things are just fantastic conversations, and you have to be at the top of your game with differentiating. But that doesn't solve the, the day for you and the ultimate buyer, the economic buyer, because if you don't follow that tech, you know, people say, well, yeah, that's a priority, but, you know, we're going to, we need to see, you know, the Seymours of the world. We need to see more. We need to, you need to figure out why they can't wait another day. So what happens if the security what happens if the security in this customer portal is not where it needs to be? What is the risk associated to the company? If, the, if they're not able to have these features that allow the buyer, excuse me, the end customer to utilize multiple applications, then they're missing out on revenue implications. So if you just sit in the technical world and don't connect yourself, and Jason, it's not a big leap. I'm looking at a door over here. It's like right next to the door. You got to go yeah. through the door and you got to go to the business outcomes. You got to go to the lines of business. You got to go, you know, this isn't lost on me, by the way. CIOs, and I know that not all of your people are selling, you know, IT solutions. So we can get in the chat, you know, where I can be more relevant for everybody. Let's just take CIOs, for example. The number one problem of a CRO, and it's been the number one problem or concern for a CIO for the last 10 years. You'd think it'd be, you know, it's in the top three for sure. It'd be security and uh, mobility and those things, but it's always in the top three, aligning IT with the line of business. Just write that one down for a second. It's been that way for decades. Why? Because IT or technical solutions are born and are sponsored to solve business outcomes. It's huge expenditures inside of companies, and it's got to be tied to business outcomes. So that's a little bit of the why. I know you're going to follow up probably with how. Well, let's say you know nothing about a company. Let's just say you know nothing about a company. What I do is I draw a bullseye, and I say, okay, what's going on in that industry? So I don't know anything going on in this specific company, but can I get on the internet right now and look at what are the top five challenges for banks right now? And so I can understand what's going on. The outer ring of the bullseye is what's going on at the, the, the uh, industry level. And now I can start to understand what discovery questions I can ask is how are those pressures creating pressures inside the company at the departmental level. Now I can understand and start to ask discovery questions of how those industry and departmental challenges are putting pressure on individuals. But Jason, as you teach, and as you very well know, people get lazy and they do it the opposite. They try to go personal with people. They're on the phone with people. They're trying to build personal relationships and what's happening to you personally. And they're missing this opportunity of, company challenges, departmental challenges, company challenges, and industry challenges. So putting those yeah. two together of the why, I talked about the why, and then the how is I can go to any public company and I can just read what they're talking about. The CEO in a public company is going to talk about people, process, and technology. They have to, because if they don't and they get those things wrong and they miss numbers and they misrepresent numbers or what have you, they go to jail. That's what, you know, <laughs> that's what Sarbanes-Oxley was all about years ago. And so I go to, if it's a privately held company, I go to and I find a publicly held company in that industry and just hear what those see. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So again, I talked a little bit about the why. And I tried to give you a little bit of spirit around the how. And um, I'll stop there because I told you I ramble on a little bit. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no, I love it. And I just what Mike Kennedy dropped into the chat is a really good example, just so people can see. And Charles said, you get delegated to those you sound like big problems. Absolutely. It's like, yeah, Absolutely. you always get delegated down when you talk about features and benefits and all this other kind of stuff. Um, yeah, write this one down too, Charles. Write this one down. Write it down on a piece of paper. Follow the money. 
Right now, <laughs> you have to follow the money. It was the number one clue that was given by, yep. you know, the people that, op- that that blew open Watergate back in, you know, in our country, in the United States. We had the President Nixon and the, and the you know, scandal that they had. They had Deep Throat, who was the person inside giving them the information. I never forgot it. His clue was follow the money. And I took that in business and I always follow the money. Why follow the money? Following the money inside of a company uh, brings me to big business issues. Big yep. business issues are budgeted. Big business issues get prioritized. Big business issues have people with power and influence associated with them. People with power and influence have the ability to create urgency for you. So I always, especially right now, I'm writing down on a piece of paper, follow the money. And that will lead me to these things that we're talking about. No, I love that. I think the first big takeaway for any sales leader watching this is those industry trends, what your clients are prioritizing and working on, that's stuff that you can gather patterns and supply a one-page document to your account yeah. executives where, hey, we're going to talk about bigger picture stuff that's going on with our clients right now, stuff that's yeah. going on in the industry, stuff that we know that these executives care about. That's where the in- first part of enablement can happen is around some of the messaging around that and supplying that so that AEs don't have to hunt for it. I think the second thing, so we're going to start to segue into very strategic type of stuff that you guys can do on your team. So again, if you're watching this as a rep, these are things that you can facilitate on your team as well. You call it getting in the pit. I call it rubbing shoulders. That's what I was taught you know, back in the day. Same, same kind of thing. Um, you said in our prep conversation, I wrote this down because I thought it was really good. You said, uh, we're in danger of asking reps to do something that we don't know how to do ourselves. And I yeah. think that what you were referring to there was <clears throat> since outbound is becoming such a larger focus, we we have people in management and leadership positions that aren't really able to do this skill well themselves, which is, which is, which is an issue, <laughs> you know, but do you want to talk a little bit more about getting in the pit and this rubbing shoulders, you know, kind I of will. concept. To this I activity? will. And, and thank you for, Thank you for highlighting that. Let's just be real for a second. So I'm 59 years old. Um, I didn't work in an environment. I didn't grow up in an environment that had SDRs and BDRs and customer success and what have you. And I went to a customer. I went to a, you know, where I got my big education and the enterprise world was working for PTC where we were selling seats of so- enterprise licenses of software for, you know, twenty five to $50,000 per seat. And so what makes me an expert on selling that way? Well, it, you know, it's, there's nothing I can do about that, that I didn't grow up in that era, but it doesn't mean that I can't deeply understand the roles of today. And so for me, when I, and I came up with that topic, when I, I remember I was in a company and they were saying, yeah, we can't get the people to do this. We can't get the people to do that. We can't get the SDRs to do this, BDRs. And I, I asked some of the leadership team and I said, well, when's the last time you showed them how to do it? Yeah. When's the last time you did it yourself? And they were like, in some cases, Jason, they've never done it. And, but that's okay because, you know, you got, you know, you look at the New, e- New England Patriots and you got Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick was not a Hall of Fame or an all pro, uh, you know, NFL football player. But he has won more championships than any other modern day coach. So I don't want to confuse. It says if you didn't play, you know, Hall of Fame football, you can't coach it. So I don't want to confuse that. But making sure that you understand what we need to have happen in the role. So I want to answer this two ways. First of all, if you are an AE today, how this conversation came up with you and I, Jason, if you're an AE today, And you're sitting around complaining. This also happened to me a couple of months ago. I had an AE kind of complaining about, I can't get the SDR to do this. I don't get marketing to do this. I got no qualified leads, blah, 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 blah. And I'm not minimizing that. I know there's difficulties and challenges. But my first question is, I said, when's the last time you've been in the pit? That's where this came from. When's the last time you've been in the pit? And they go, what do you mean? I said, when's the last time you sat down with a BDR or an SDR? or anybody in marketing or anybody working on, you know, qualified leads or what have you. And when's the last time you kind of at, you know, told them what your expectation was and you didn't just tell them you showed them. So I said, when's the last time you got on the phone with a BDR and SDR and you did a warm call 
to it, you told them how to do, a, you, you kind of showed them how to do a warm call. I'm like, I went and I said, Hey, have you done this before in your career? And they go, of course I did that before I did this. And they were kind of all indignant about it. Of course I know how to do that. And I said, okay, well, when's the last time you showed, and I called it getting in the pit. And we just had some really good experiences because it's been a while for some of these AEs or even some sales managers or what have you. And getting in the pit, I think, is a really, really good and also being kind of open. And when I get in the pit at force management, I like to joke around a little bit because sometimes I'm a little rusty. And, you know, yeah. I like to, I like to, you know, I'll get off the phone or whatever, and it didn't go so well or whatever. And I'll, I'll look at everybody and I'll say, Hey, give me some feedback. And the call sucked. Let's just say the call sucked. And people be looking at me and they're like, you were great. That was great. And I'm like, no, no, here's how I want you to give me the feedback. Tell me two things you liked about what we just did on this call with this customer. Tell me two things that you like. And I'm being real serious here. This is the best way to get feedback and to give feedback. Tell me two things that you liked about what we just did. Tell me two things you'd do differently. And that's what the most elite companies, the most elite players inside these companies, I don't care how long you've been selling, if you've been selling zero days or 30 years, that is a really, really good format to use. And so, you know, and by the way, if I'm, a, you know, getting in the pit also goes the other way, Jason. If I'm an SDR or BDR, I see some uh, language here. I see some language here that says I'm aspiring. I'm, you know, I'm going to be, I want to be, you know, an AE or what have you. The best advice I can give you is act like you already have the job. You want the next job? Act like you already have the job. First, you got to know what the job is. You got to know what, you know, what is an AE doing with your qualified leads or what are they doing with that? So how can I make that even better? Um, can I give more information like the problems that the customer solving, that the customer wants us to solve, how specifically we solve it? What critical differentiators do we have that might help in this conversation? What are some good proof points that you research based upon getting ready to call this customer? Why couldn't you bring that down the line and maybe even say, can you imagine, Jason, the day when you're working with an AE and you're a BDR? Think about if you're an AE and you had a BDR or an SDR come to you and say, hey, Jason, these are the positive business outcomes that this customer is trying to achieve. I got a couple of these business outcomes that they're trying to achieve. And based upon that, these are the technical required capabilities that they're focusing on. And here's a couple of key differentiators that we talked about. And here's how they said they were going to measure success. Just if you thought about that little positive business outcomes, required capabilities that are highly differentiated for your company and metrics, how the customer is going to measure success. By the way, Jason, you need all of that in place before you can even begin to talk about what your company does for a living. Because if you do it too early, I don't know what the business outcomes are. Therefore, I'm not attaching the biggest outcomes by the time I talk about what my solutions are. I don't know what their technical required capabilities are. So I'm just speaking about technical required capabilities out over here. I don't know how they're going to measure success. So therefore, I don't know what great looks like for this customer. Those three simple things between a BDR organization, you know, BDR, SDR, the front end of the chain, marketing qualified lead whatever mechanism that you have to AEs and back and forth and then getting in the pit. If I'm an AE, let's talk about how to get a customer to tell us about positive business outcomes. Let me get on the phone with you and show you how I do that with a customer. Um, I'm just all about that right now. I see elite, I see elite sellers out there that have not forgotten where they've come from. I see elite BDRs out there that know that they want the next job and they're elevating themselves because they're acting like they've already got the job. And those are two really good kind of mechanisms to counterbalance. Did I, yeah. did I answer your question? Ooh. I don't know if I even answered yeah. your question. <laughs> yeah. Act like, act like you already have the job. I, uh, yeah. I think they're like what I took away from that. There's some very tangible things that as a sales leader that you can help facilitate. I think one of them this is something I try to integrate with all of my clients is structured prospecting power hours. I call them get shit done sessions. Yeah. Especially yeah. for full cycle sales reps and account executives. If you just got everyone to commit one or two hours a week where as a small team, 
your account executives get together on a Zoom call, you put yourselves on mute and you make some phone calls together or write some emails together. And in the Amen. chat, you try to replicate the virtual, you know, a sales floor virtually as best as you can. Amen. Just getting in there. And as a manager, you make some calls too. You know, that's uh, one other rubbing shoulders thing that I'll share. And we talked about this before is this happened at one of my clients. And I just love, he shared this story. He's like a rep came in and she was like, you know, Mr. Manager, I've been having you know, so much trouble getting a hold of this one prospect. He's like, let's call him right now. And I, I love that attitude of let's just pick up the phone and make it happen right now. And they call the prospect and lo and behold, they get a hold of the prospect and they set a meeting with a, you know, it was like a VP of customer support at a really key account that they were going after just from this, like, let's just make it happen kind of attitude. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, let's just pick up yeah. the phone and like that willingness to just do the activity with the person, just showing that is so big when you see There's that a, from leadership, you know? I like it, Jason. I like it so much. It's a little thing my dad taught me back in the day, God rest his soul, but my father told me a little, taught me a little saying that says um, a couple things. Number one, act like you already been there. I had some problems in sports where I, you know, I had some excessive celebration or what have you over my opponents that <laughs> my father didn't like. And I always loved that. He said, act like you've already been there or act yeah. like you've been there before. And then the other thing he said to me is don't ask people to do things that you are unwilling yeah. to do yourself. Do not ask people to do things that you are unwilling to do yourself. And I, I, I saw it, I saw it manifest itself in my early years of selling where somebody was asking me to do something that they were unwilling to do themselves or also that they didn't know how to do themselves. And I was okay yeah. if somebody didn't know how to do it and they were still asking me to do it. But if they weren't acknowledging that they didn't know how to do it and therefore they weren't giving me help with the how, um, I really resented it. And then you get resentment yeah. inside your organization. We've all been there. Now, what I don't want you to just, I don't want you to, you know, I don't want you to stay in that mode. So if you've got a leader that's asking you to do something that they're unwilling to do themselves or unable to do themselves, um, you know, don't form a coalition and go, you know, pick it or whatever. You can do that, but I'm, you know, fix it. And what I mean by fixing it is participate in your own rescue. Go find the people. When I, I played college football, and I remember I was frustrated a little bit. I wasn't getting the playing time. I played as a freshman, and I lettered as a freshman, so I really thought that I was, but I wasn't really getting in the main rotation. And what I realized was, uh, and they don't spend that much time with the freshmen. But what I realized was, and there was a guy in front of me. His name was John Rady. He played for 15 years in the NFL. And what did I do? Regardless of whether that coach was coaching me, John Rady's playing right in front of me every day. He's practicing right in front of me. And then on the weekends, he's playing. And then every day we're watching film. So, Jason, what did I do? I watched and studied John Rady. And I hope that translates around the world. There are people that are killing it inside your companies. There are SDRs and BDRs that are elite. There are AEs and account managers that are elite. Go look at the excuse department is closed with your, whatever you're getting or not getting from your company or your manager. Go find those people that are doing the job well. And I got another tip here, Jason. Make sure that you understand the fundamentals and the mechanics on why that person's doing well. Because you can't look at, you know, John Rady. If I looked at John Rady, he was bigger than me and way faster than me. Where I, I could look at that and say, well, I can never be John Rady. That's not true. What I looked at was John Rady's fundamentals. I looked at his footwork. I looked at the way he positioned himself on the field. I looked at his work ethic. And to the best of my ability, and by the way, I went to John Rady after practice and I said, hey, John, I want to try to get better. And it's amazing. It's like in business, when you ask people for advice, they love to give advice. When you ask a procurement person for advice, they have more of a tendency to engage with you and give you advice. If you ask them for something like not to do a discount or not, if you ask somebody for something, they, they resist you a little bit, but ask them for advice. It's unbelievable. And so I, I really, really encourage people to do that. Leaders, if you're listening, you're asking people to do things that you don't know how to do yourself or you're unwilling to do. Listen to what we just said. 
If you're experiencing that on the other end, go find somebody in the organization who is demonstrating very high value and then analyze what are the mechanics. Because what you need to learn is the mechanics. I couldn't run as fast as John Rady. I couldn't do the things, but I could up my game and my footwork. I could up my game and my conditioning. I could do those things. And I've always lived by that. Oh, the excuse department is closed. Yeah, I love that. Another thing that comes to mind from what you shared too is as a sales leader, help helping facilitate some of those conversations in you know, whether that's buddy system, hey, rep A struggles with this thing, but does this thing really well? Rep B is sort of the opposite. <laughs> you know, just like, hey, I want you to buddy up with John this week. And he is awesome at cold calling and he's really good at time management. That's an area that you're struggling right now. I want you to like follow this person, have a meeting with them and report back on what you took away, you know, and kind of facilitating that stuff. And the other thing I took away from you too is that, uh, this is something I struggled with as a as a seller early in my career was not being shy about asking for help and not being shy about your development, like just being like ferocious almost about your learning. You know what I mean? Yeah. Doing whatever it takes to get the advice that you need. Yeah. So that's bugging like- your VP of sales. Maybe if you want a meeting with your, like as a rep, that's, that's a really killer thing to do is to get a one-on-one with your VP of sales, right? Yeah. Be, be relentless about your self-improvement, you know? Um, I I want to talk to you about franchise mindset. Can Um, I just follow up on that really quick? I know (laughs) you you just just unlock some things for me. First of all, let's just give a quick coaching model. It's as simple as you can read thousands of books. Let me see if I can simplify a coaching model for you. If you're a leader listening to this, the first thing you have to do is you have to tell somebody what's expected of them. That's table stakes. Tell somebody what's expected of them. The next thing you have to do is you have to show them how to do it. Now, it's okay if you're a leader and you might not be the best one to show them how to do that. You have other people in your organization that might be able to show them how to do that. And I call those people level fours. They're high skill and they're high will. And a lot of times they get a lot of enjoyment, a lot of validation by you know, being validated that they're at the best at what they do. And then you're going to ask them very specifically, you're going to ask them, hey, show them how to do this, show them how to make a cold call, a warm call or whatever. Okay. Tell, show, then you got to observe it. So many people drop the ball on this, Jason, the coaches, they don't watch it. So they say, okay, I told you what to do. I know somebody showed you how to do it. Our enablement team showed you how to do it. They don't get in the pit. They don't watch them do it. And it's a fundamental, you know, validation that you have to do. And then the, and then the last one is you got to give them feedback. Two things you liked about what they did and two things you would do differently. And then another thing that you said is you talked about asking for help. I just want you to write this one down too. I had a, I had a boss tell me this. I see people are writing stuff down. So I love, I love you guys for writing this stuff down. A lot of times I say, write it down. I don't know whether people are writing it down or not, but I like, but I like this one. It's, they told me this, Hey, John, stop trying to convince me that you have all the answers on this account. If I thought you had all the answers on these deals or what have you, they wouldn't need me as a sales manager. So just take a deep breath and relax. It's okay not to know something, but it's not okay not to be doing something about it. And once that leader kind of introduced that principle to me, I began leading that way and I've led that way for the rest of my career. And I, I, I try to tell people, hey, stop it. This isn't a badge of courage. This isn't a badge of honor by trying to prove to me that, oh, yes, we do have an economic buyer. Oh, yes, this is our champion or what have you. I don't want you to have that disposition. It's okay not to know, but it's not okay not to be doing anything about it. Let me help you get unstuck. I find that the most elite coaching organizations, the most elite performing organizations have that principle in place. Sorry, I just wanted to, I just wanted to uh, get, I wanted to remind myself of that when I wrote it down. Oh man, I love that. You're never going to have me on again because we're never going to get through your agenda. I'm sorry. (laughs) Oh, no, it's not about my agenda. I think that people are getting a lot of value from it, man. Yeah, brother. Um, Let's talk about franchise mindset. And there's this concept of, you know, are we creating a viable environment? 
you know, for our reps, what are, what's the franchise mindset and what are the things that as uh, sales leaders we need in order to create a viable environment for our reps to thrive in? This came to me years ago, Jason, when I had the realization that I am responsible when I was a, a seller, I am responsible for owning my piece of dirt, whatever it is. I say a piece of dirt is, it could be a number of accounts. It could be whatever my assignment is. I'm responsible. So therefore I should know more about what's going on in that assignment than anybody else on the planet. And I took that to heart. I don't want marketing to know more about what I'm doing. I don't want my boss to know more about what I'm doing, my sales manager, whatever. It's my responsibility. So my mindset was, it was kind of this franchisee model. Okay, so wait a second. I've been given a franchise from a franchisor. So I'm a franchisee. Okay, well, what do I get from the franchisor? What I get from the franchisor is the brand. I get the products. I get the you know, the marketing influence, I get the product specialists, I get all of these resources. And I started to think about it. Okay, okay. Now, therefore, it's my responsibility. And I, this is where in force management, command of the plan was born. We have command of the message, command of the sale, command of the plan and command of the talent. Command of the plan is all about planning to make the plan. How many of you are listening right now and waiting for the company to say, okay, we're going to do planning for 2023. And really what it means in most companies is here's your quota. You're going to get your quota and then we'll negotiate all about your quota. It's a complete waste of time. Like yeah. I started thinking about it, but what's happening to me at a company, my first company that I work for is a great company, really well-known company, great company, great sales teaching company was awesome. Xerox corporation. Okay. Well, what they did to me, Jason, is no matter what my number was, so if I was 200% of plan, guess what my quota was next year? 200%. So that's the baseline. And it was driving me nuts. And I would whine like a big dog. I would whine like you could not believe. I'm like, and I tell them, you're, you're impacting my family. You're impacting this. one. And then finally, I said, hold it. I need to get a really specific business mindset. And, and all joking aside, this is when I really feel like I upped my game from a business person standpoint. So I started to look at this franchise model and I didn't start with the quota. I said, what is it that I want to make? And I want everybody to listen to this. I said, what I started with, what do I want to make? What do I want to make from, you know, from, you know, from this patch of dirt that I have from this assignment? And if it was 300% of plan, I don't care what it was. You know, every year that number had to go up and up and up because that's how it worked back then. And I said, let me see if I can build a business plan around it. It's my responsibility to do that, not to whine to my boss that my quota is too high or I can't make the money I'm going to make. You'd be amazed how many people leave from one company and the next company. They haven't even gone through this exercise. So I started to do it. And the first thing I did was, okay, I know I have to put together a plan to do X amount of revenue, not my quota. I didn't wait for anybody to tell me to do this. It wasn't a compliance that, you know, you got to put together your plan and then we'll review it. Uh, uh I put together my plan and then I, I made people review it. So Jason, what I would do is I'd put together and say, okay, let's just say um, back, it might not be relevant for everybody, but everybody has some type of an assignment, whatever your assignment was. I'll just give you an example. So I had users and non-users. I know people sometimes only have non-users, sometimes only have users, whatever. But I had, the first thing I did was I looked at my top 10 accounts my top 10 users and my top 10 non-users. And dude, I had to be honest with myself. I had to really do a dose of reality. And I would look in my user community. I would look for things like white space. Where are they not using me? Where am I vulnerable? And for you now, <clears throat> most of the sellers listening here, your, your business models are mostly based on renewals and based on you. So, you know, where are we vulnerable or where are we, where can we sell more goods and services? Because what I did understand is that a, a, a current user of our stuff is more likely to buy more stuff from us. That's just as old. That's thousands of years old. So I had to tighten up my game on that. And then I looked at my non-user community. And I'm like, you know, to be honest with myself, I was looking and I said, look, I'm making my number. 
not so much off this non-user community. For me to make this number, I got to get into my non-user community. Okay, what does that mean? What's my value proposition? What is my differentiation? What are the things that I have to really, really focus on? What are the common themes? Am I given an industry? Am I given a, you know, depending upon what your assignment is. I had to be on my game. What problems do we solve for those customers? How specifically do we solve them? How do we solve them differently or better than the competition that's in there? And where have we done it before? I had to have those four essential questions of value answered. And so then I looked at that and I said, okay, now what are the critical activities that I have to do in these accounts? Who are my resources that can help me? I had marketing leads. I had, you know, SDRs or BDRs, whatever the equivalents are today. I had product specialists. I had events that the company was going to do. I had webinars at the company. It's my responsibility to take advantage of all that, not have my manager tell me, hey, did you get anybody signed up for the webinars? Did you get anybody to come to this golf outing or whatever? That's so ludicrous. Like, it's my responsibility to utilize those resources. It costs me nothing. Companies providing that. Okay, let me just keep going on this if you're okay. Then the next thing I would do, Jason, is I would look at it and I'd say, okay, now I'm going to do the numbers and say, if I was to get all of this business, can I make the money that I need to make? And if the answer was no, I'd go back to my leaders and I'd say, hey, look, I put together the plan. If I went and got all this business here, I can't make the money I need to make. And Jason, you know what they started to do? Give me more patch. They gave me more accounts. They trusted me. I trusted them that they would give me an assignment that would fulfill my hopes, wants, desires, and dreams, provided I was worthy of it. And I proved myself worthy of it. Well, guess what happened sometimes, Jason? When I had more than I needed, I actually didn't wait for my boss and say, hey, look, um, you're not calling on these accounts, so we're going to redistribute them to to one of the newer people or what have you. I sometimes looked at my boss and I said, although it wasn't easy for me to do, but if I'm a business person and understanding a franchise or a franchisee, I went back to my boss and said, look, I'm just not going to get to these two accounts this year. I'd love to, but I just knowing what I have here, redistribute these because he or she has given me the same benefit throughout my experience with them. And the last thing I did, Jason, was I did this risk mitigation. Here are things that have to go well. Like the product that we're talking about releasing, a lot of this plan is based on this product. If that gets delayed in any form or fashion, my plan is at risk. And what I would do is I do this risk mitigate and I'd say, okay, what do I do to mitigate that? Now, when my bosses looked at this plan, Jason, they were like, when Kaplan submits a plan for us, it's no nonsense. It's like, let's look in and see where he's saying he's strong, where he's saying he's weak, where he's saying he needs the the help from the company. And guess what they did? This was our QBR. Why would we use anything else? So they would use my plan to manage me and help me throughout the course of the year. And that's how, that's where I came up with, that's what, what I, that's where for force management years later, we came up with this concept of command of the plan. That's what I mean by a franchise mentality. Woo. So <laughs> I think there's a couple of really big takeaways there for everyone. Um, you talked about, instead of looking at the quota, how much money do I need to make? And this is something I, I think that as a sales leader, also, you can facilitate this. You talk about uh, needing an emotional attachment to the number. The way that yeah. you create an emotional attachment to your number or the number that your reps are given is when there's a reason why the number is the number. You know what I mean? It's like if your quota is let's say your OTE is 150K. Uh, If you need to make 200K, set the goals around 200K. Don't set a a goals around making your your quota, you know? But I think really getting very specific with the math, this is something that everyone watching this can do. What is the math I need to make? How many deals will uh, will I need to close? How many sales calls will I need to do or opportunities will I need to create? And translate that all the way down to the outbound activity that you need to do. And that's sort of the key to get as a leader AEs to prospect a little bit more is show them that, hey, you want to hit this number. And based on how this typically goes with inbound and what you'll get from SDRs, 
you need to go out and self-source about 30% of that. And here's yeah. what that looks like from an activity standpoint. And there's like a meaning behind going to the gym and doing the hard work every day of prospecting because you have this goal six, 12 months down the road. That's the so big good. part that kind of stuck out to me. So good. I agree 1000%. So good. <laughs> um, the other thing too, is it sounds like what you basically did was a SWOT, like a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, kind of assessment on your patch. And yeah. I don't know. I think that's such a, another good takeaway that you shared where you're putting a plan together. And as a sales leader, I'm so much more willing to help someone that's put in effort. It's no oh, different yeah. than selling too to a prospect. Like heck people yeah. are willing to meet you halfway when they can see that you're putting in effort and thinking about this. And I think another really underrated thing that you shared too, is just being a team player. I feel like there's so much talk on LinkedIn right now about looking out for yourself and don't get me wrong. You do need to look out for yourself, but you know, look out for the company too. Like you can do both. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be one or the other, you know? Um, okay. So we have what, about maybe five or six minutes left. I want to get, Amanda's got a question and let, let me know you guys, if you got questions, drop them into the Q and a for us. Uh, Amanda Sanchez asks, uh, where do you recommend salespeople and leaders read up on their market economics? Uh, uh, like uh, the economy, so to speak, and just staying in tune with their buyer's market. Like what are some tangible things, I guess, that someone could do to stay on top of kind of the macroeconomic trends? Such a good question. So for important? me, it is. So for me, this is something my father also instilled in me at a very early age. He said, you know, I want you to read the newspaper front to back every day. And when I was younger, I was like, Ugh, that's the last thing I wanted to do. But yeah. You know, I can't tell you how that training actually trained my mind to pattern recognize things that I see multiple times and see it as a trend. And today, what I do, like this morning, I get up every single morning and I, you know, I don't want the haters out there to say, you're not doing it right. You shouldn't do cardio every day, whatever. I get on and I get on an elliptical or treadmill right through this room right here. I got a full gym behind me, which is awesome. I got the excuse yeah. department is closed. There's a sign in there that says the excuse <laughs> department is closed. And I get on every morning and I do two things. I, I, I read two different things. Now, I know I'm talking from the United States point of view. I read a publication called the Wall Street Journal. Whatever is um, you're appropriate in whatever country you're in, they have equivalents to the Wall Street Journal from wherever you are around the world. You should read that every single day. In my opinion, you should read it every single day. Now, sometimes I don't get the chance to read the whole thing front to back, but I get an email. I'm looking at my email right now. They send me an email. It's free. The, the signed up for the distribution list. And it says, if you want to know the top things that are published in there, the top 10 things, and sometimes that's all I have the ability to read. And at the end of the day, things happen during the day. They send me another email that says, here are the 14 points of what happened today. And I read those. Yeah. Could I be Netflixing or could I be doing something else? Of course I could be doing something else. I choose to do that. The other thing that I do, and this is kind of a, a, cool publication. I think it might fit some of the demographic. It might be a little bit younger than me that might be listening. There's a great publication out there called The Morning Brew. I'm a big fan yeah. of that. It's called The Morning Brew. And they also have a number. So they've got a CIO brew. They've got a high tech brew. They've got a cybersecurity brew. And they've got all of these great little offshoots of it. And it comes to my email box. So the point is, there's no shortage of information. Be disciplined on how you consume it. And I got to tell you, I'll be in a lot of meetings during the day and I'll say, hey, this reminds me of the article I read in the Wall Street Journal. I'll be on the phone with the CIO or something. I'll say in the CIO section of the Wall Street Journal, I'm not trying to impress anybody. I'm trying to get to the point. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to be um, interesting. I'm trying to act interested, if, if that makes sense. I, I'm not using it in a way of, oh, look at me. I, I've read something. I read it so I can be interested in what's happening for, uh, you know, for my customer. So there's a number of things, whatever your publications around the world, just commit yourself to it. Start slow. I started to accumulate more. I 
started just with the Wall Street Journal. I got hungry. I looked for some offshoots on cybersecurity, on high tech or what have you. And all that came from there. Actually, I think the Morning Brew actually came from an ad or something from the Wall Street Journal. I would do that. If I were you, I would do that. Love it. The uh, other thing I would add too is there's a lot of good industry podcasts out there these days too, where you can listen oh, yeah. to interviews with the personas that you, you sell to. Um, Sorry, I, I didn't even say that. Yeah, there's so many good ones out there. You know, yours obviously is a great one. We've got a couple, one called the Revenue Builders and, and another one called the Audible Ready Sales Podcast. There's yeah. so many good ones out there to just be on your game, be a student of the game. Yeah. I got one more kind of rapid fire question for you. Yeah, um, brother. Knowing what you know now about sales, leadership, all of that kind of stuff, what advice would you give to yourself as a first time seller? The advice that I would give myself to as a first time seller is right now, be a student of the game. If I could have learned how to be, I'm a student of the game now. I'm 59 years old. And I get paid to be a student of the game. If I could have been a student of the game back in the day when I was a young seller, I would have done things more, pers uh, more purposefully. I would have said to myself, hey, look, there are knowledge and skills available to me. And I want to make sure I consume all the knowledge that my company, that's the company's responsibility. They also give me the ability to, to, you know, to hone my skills. And then there's also character that gets created. And the character that gets created is I would want to be, and I, I pride myself on this today, be uncommon. This is my advice. Be uncommon. Do things that the common man or woman chooses not to do. And I've never seen that formula equal failure. Be an outbound, you know, act like you already have the job. If you want the next job, act like you already have the job. That's uncommon. Get in the pit. If you're trying to figure out how to get better quality leads and you got SDRs and BDRs, go rub shoulders, get in the pit. That's uncommon. Go have an outside in approach with a customer. Only speak to them about what you can do for a living until don't do it until you understand what their problem or challenges is and you understand what the business outcomes and how they're going to measure that. That's uncommon. Be a great listener. That's uncommon. So my best advice is be uncommon. Being uncommon gets noticed and it'll get noticed. It gets noticed today. It got noticed 30 years ago. It'll get noticed, you know, 50 years after you and I are both gone. Yeah. Woo. Love that. I'm like fired up to go sell now. Um, we're about to, we're about 30 seconds left here. Where can people go to connect with you and appreciate all the engagement from everyone in the chat as well. Where can people, yeah, your people are you? awesome, oh, man. Your people are awesome. Like this is, this is a, uh, uh, first of all, again, congratulations. And by the way, all of you people around the world that took the time to do this, let me make a comment. That's uncommon. The average man or woman chooses not to be on this podcast today. Oh, I'll wait for it to be, you know, to come out or somebody to tell me about it. So that's awesome. So I commend all of you. Thanks for spending time with us today. A couple of places you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on social media. Um, I'm, I'm active on LinkedIn mostly. Um, and then um, you can find us on www.forcemanagement.com. So um, I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Force Management. You can find uh, a great uh, individual platform to be a student of the game is called Ascender, which is powered by force management for individual contributors out there. That's at uh, www.ascender, A-S-C-E-N-D-E-R.co.co. Really, really excited about that. Um, I don't know. There's probably a million other ways. Uh, Revenue Builders Podcast and the Audible Ready Sales Podcast yep. is another way that you can find us. But um I, I guess we're out there. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for coming on, John. Let's give him some love on LinkedIn too. Let's see if we can blow up his uh, LinkedIn. I dropped it into the chat. And uh, John, thank you so much for coming on. And everyone else, have a, have a good rest of your week. We'll see you later. Jason, everyone. keep doing it, brother. Thank, thank you. you. Keep doing it.